Uh, hello, everybody. Cool. Let's get started. So, hello, everybody. Welcome to Winding On. My name is Matthew Bowden, the Incredible Rogue, and today we are here with Stuart Goldsmith. Stu, how you doing, buddy? Really well, thank you, mate. And my, might I say congratulations on the name The Incorrigible Rogue, which uh, I think is a pun too complex for the lay person. But uh, I think I think that's really good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, not very many times do you see a name that comes from an 1844 piece of law that you misspell and rewrite to, to pervert the meaning. I was quite proud of it. Yeah. So, uh, Stu, let's get off to the beginning, OK? I did a little looking in your bio. I checked out how you began. It said you started in circus school. Was that your first performing experience? No, it wasn't. No, I started uh, probably my first probably my first performing experience ever was about the age of like 10 or 11 when me and my brother would do uh, sketches from the comic relief book that they sent out that you could do here here's a copyright free sketches so you can do them and uh, make money and send it to comic relief uh, but we opted not to do that because we were children so we used to do them on holiday in front of my parents and um, that's probably the first bit i remember i was a huge fan of lenny henry and i used to sort of recite his stand up and sketches to kids in school the next day um, and then the first kind of proper in front of an audience performing would have been at a young people's theater group in the west midlands where i grew up called playbox were your parents thespians not remotely. No, my mum no. and my dad was a civil engineer, pretty much the opposite of a, a theatre person. Fair enough. And so did you have a kind of, why did you do it? Were you doing it because you felt like you needed to have attention? Were you nervous? Did you just find a lot of pleasure in engaging and entertaining your friends? Um, I, oh, I didn't say they were my friends. <laughs> um, I think I, um, why did I need it? Well. I definitely needed it. I suppose at the age of, I suppose as a, as a kid doing sketches, it was just funny. I liked laughing. I still very much enjoy laughing. It feels like a sort of a, a kind of a really pure experience, uncomplicated by, I really like to complicate things. I, I really liked a, a, a street performer you may know uh, called ha uh, Hamish, briefly called Hardcore Hammer, but these days called Hamish. He runs um, a Carnival Circus. Um, he said to me years ago at Edinburgh, he said, uh, oh, you like to give yourself a hard time, don't you? And uh, I absolutely do. So I think I spent my childhood pretty stressed and racked with various complex thoughts I couldn't quite uh, cope with and a lot of anxieties and stuff. And I think laughing and making people laugh seemed to me to be an escape from that. And something that something that I couldn't worry about, like whatever else I'm worried about. If I say a thing and someone laughs, that's definitely good. And I can't kind of confuse that. So why circus then? If if you wanted to make people laugh, why not just root straight into comedy? Um, because at the time, comedy seemed impossible. Um, like I didn't really ever sort of consider that as a job. And because the, the, the Young People's Theatre stuff I was involved with, um, the, one of the co-directors of it, a guy called Stuart McGill, who uh, with his wife Mary really take a, a large portion of the blame <laughs> for the direction of my life. They're, I'm forever in their debt. Um, but they were obsessed with circus. So they loved Cirque du Soleil and uh, they used to kind of direct circus elements more and more into the shows that we would do in the theatre group. And um, me and Noel Byrne, who you will probably know from uh, Covent Garden, I do. Uh, we were childhood best friends. And I actually got into Playbox through him. I discovered it through him. Um, and uh, we... Which way round did everything happen? We were about 15 or 16 when we saw someone who was not in the theatre group, but like the boyfriend of someone in the theatre group, um, doing uh, Walking on Broken Glass. And we clocked it and went and people were kind of giving him attention and going, wow. And we thought, I reckon we know how to do that. And so we went back to my mum's house and broke up a load of bottles and were correct in our uh, assumptions. And we did that and we went, hang on a minute, I can juggle. Now, I, I could juggle because I got some juggling balls for like 12th birthday and then didn't touch them for four years. So I could juggle. He, he, I thought I could juggle and stand on your head when your face is in the broken glass. I feel like Noel suggested that, which even for yeah. a senior year old is if you're thinking about doing that standing on someone's shoulders while juggling you're reasonably proficient then right oh, standing on his head he, he put his face in the broken glass and i'd surf him so he okay. was on the floor although we could no we 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 were reasonably proficient and that's like we could do a shoulder stand we could do a decent too high and um i can't remember where we learned that from it that may have been playbox as well yeah. but, you know it was it, it was a young people's theater group but they were quite kind of 
if you want to do a skill in the show, you've got to train it. So I could, by the time I was 18, I think I could do a five ball cascade. And I did that on a, a show that they did at the RSC in Stratford. It was, that was near where we were. How many days a week are you training with this theatre group then? Because that's quite intensive kind of stuff. The the skills element I would train on my own. And it was very much, you know, it was like a sort of, um, uh, like learn Diabolo and then practice Diabolo. And there are people there to impress, like, you know, girls. I went to an all boys school that I hated. And the idea of being able to learn a thing and impress someone, um, nobody at my school was very impressed with me and rightly so. So uh, I, I learned some bits and bobs and kind of trained them. By the time I had this thing of like, I reckon I'm going to be able to learn five confidently by the time we do this show at the RSC, that was like a real practice I'd do. I can't remember how frequently, but I remember it seemed to stretch on forever. So me being the age I was, it was probably half an hour a day, but I made a right meal of it. You know, but I, rem I remember proper like, oh, this is like training and I can't do it and I can't do it and I can't do it. And then I could. Yeah, um, well, I, to this day, I can't juggle five balls. I hit the four ball wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I mean, I, there's not a lot else I can do, <laughs> to be fair. I got, but the best thing I can do skills wise, when I then went to circus school, I went to Circa Media in 96. Um, the best thing I ever did was I could do, I very briefly could do a five club cascade. And I did a five club cascade and finished on like a triple and a pirouette catch. And I dropped everything and looked around me like, did anybody see that? That's the greatest thing I'll ever do. And I don't think anyone saw it. But you could walk on a rope as well. That's, yeah, that's you and I know that is not hard. <laughs> I, I taught myself a slack rope. I could do slack rope. Yes. Um, and I've done like I've had a go on a tightrope and it was sort of I went, oh, OK, that's what that is. It's different enough. And I'm too old now that I don't want to learn a new thing. I couldn't yeah. be I'd, I'd probably think about learning it now. Um, but I that was I learned off the early days of the internet how to tie a bowline. And so I would tie two bowline knots. So what's uh, a bowline? It's spelled bowline, but it's pronounced bowline. It's a tie. Oh, bowline, yes. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. So you tie that around two trees in a park in Manchester. And mm. uh, that would have been early to early two thousands. So that so it, I taught myself from the internet. Yeah. And so just to go back a little bit, what was your experiences like doing shows in the, what was the name of the original group again that you worked with? Oh, Playbox. Playbox. So, what, what was the experience of doing the shows there? What was it like for you to go on stage? Well, I loved it. I did one little show with them. I was a sort of, this is all kid, you know, I was like 14. I was, um, I was like a, back, the first part I played with them, I was like a background character in Fantastic Mr. Fox. And then the next part I got was Oliver and Oliver. And I kind of went, oh, right, I they really think I can do this. And um, I think it probably satisfied a lot of my desires to do something that people cared about, to do something that was the opposite of school. Like it really felt my school was a sort of a factory for churning out advertising executives and doctors and, and people like that. I'm, <laughs> I'm naming two specific friends there. And that's what I ended up doing. Um, I love those friends. But um uh it was it was a real kind of like it's a proper job place and we're constantly being told i got a scholarship to, to a fee-paying school and you're the top two percent of the country and it was loads of pressure i was bullied by a teacher there i was really unhappy and i just kind of in this crucible kind of formed the idea of whatever i do it has to be other than this it has to be the opposite of this and it felt like a oh, drama is that's a thing that's a credible alternative that's a real thing in the world and it's the absolute opposite of this. So most of my life has been an attempt to kind of run away from uh, that school. And I, you know, I've sort of I've said this before, but I, I feel like a lot of why I still am a comedian, even, is I'm still trying to prove something to a bunch of children that no longer exist. You know, I, Fair I, enough. I, I don't know what that thing is, but, you know, like it's there are you know, performing is kind of vocational, right? It's a calling. You go, I have to do this. And I think for me, a long, a big part of that journey was I have to, like it was a sort of needy, desperate thing rather than a healthy, strong desire to perform. It was like a compulsive, oh God, I've got to, I just have to be this version of myself that I've made up. And so my, my career as a street performer was very fraught with pulling off a show and feeling heroic bailing a show and just being in tears in literal floods of tears and like i can't do this and i want to be this thing and i'm not managing and it wasn't you know all, all of that kind of stuff but isn't that interesting is that it seems a lot of people i interview they have these initial drives 
when they're young of, as you say, the thing you want to be, this aspiration, this unattainable, perfect figure. And then the rest of their life is driving and pushing for this unattainable goal. But because you've pushed and you do push yourself and you try to get this unattainable thing, you do do things most people don't do. You said rope walking's easy. Rope walking has a very steep learning curve. Most people give it up before they get to the point sure. of being able to do it. Okay. And the same thing with comedy, perhaps. The same thing with juggling five balls, doing street shows. This yeah. steep learning curve. Oh, you do. You you get a lot out of a compulsion. Like it's a real, it's a real good motivator. Feeling like you're a piece of. Can I swear on this part? I assume. Yeah, you can swear. You can swear. If swear. you feel like I'm a piece of shit if I don't manage to learn this trick, that is a good motivator. I'm not denying that. Whether it's a healthy motivator, I don't know. And I think there are. We know a lot of performers who are happy and we know a lot of performers who are not happy and i think it is a very difficult thing to do to decouple your sense of self-worth from how well last night's show went or yesterday morning's show or whatever it is so you will certainly you know i mean jackie chan arguably the finest comedian of all time certainly a huge hero of mine when he was a child he went to the peking opera school and they beat him with sticks until he could do backflips and Sure, I'd rather have a happy kid than can't do backflips, you know. So it's it's definitely a, it's definitely a, a motivator, and I suppose there are there are healthy things as well about the desire to do good and to be special and what have you. But I think for me, I'm always regretful that at the heart of it was a sort of pretty craven, needy sort of part of myself, you know. Like the the. the, the the moments when it works, the moments when you land the trick or the moments when you and what for me over the course of my street performing career, it became far more important to me to improvise a really good joke than uh, than to land a trick. But those moments, which are whether you're you know at the top of a Chinese pole doing your best thing or whatever, or how I imagine Hamish feels when he does the steps through the air, you know, like the from Hamish from the English gents, um, those peak moments are you know they kind of you you feel filled up with value don't you the crowd roars and you go i am worth something so or, or i did and it would be so lovely wouldn't it for the crowd to roar and you, and for you to go oh this is nice <laughs> rather than this validates me but do you have the is the crowd roaring validating you because you believe you're doing something valuable or is it just the love is it the validation of the work or is it the validation? Well, it's not, not even necessarily validation, but just the attention. Well, I think it's a good question. I think we all know that you can get the crowd to roar with by doing something you're proud of, or you can get the crowd to roar by doing something, you know, let's not bring hack into it, but doing something that is uh, not innovative or not honest or not true or not your best self. It's like a thing that works. And so I'll, I'll do this. I'll do that gag. I have see something happens. Oh, someone had something for this. It was this bang, huge round of applause. You look like a, st a star. And that doesn't, you know, does, do you feel the value from that? Well, yeah, you do. Because part of you is like, I thought of the thing. I was still brave enough to be here and say it, you know, I might not have come up with it, but I joined the dots. I was fast enough. And I was brave enough to come out here and be in the zone. Um, so you probably do feel like a kind of pat on the back to a greater or lesser extent. But I think the people that we all watch and go, oh, how will I ever be like them? You know, the the in street performing terms, the Pepe's, the Anthony Living Spaces, the Herbie Treeheads, the 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 people. I think there should be Herbie's Treehead, like the Courts Marshal. Um, but the those people, they got the stuff that they did by taking real risk and having real rhythm and real discovery. And it's very easy to see that and simply ape the discovery, ape the results of the discovery, mimic the results of the discovery. And so uh, I forget my point. <laughs> but, you know, but yeah, basically that, I think there is value. That's what you're asking. There is value when you make a real discovery and there is a certain value to, to, kind of making a fake discovery or just doing a bit or do even if it's a line you wrote but you wrote it 10 years ago and really you should be doing better turnover than that well it's i ask you it belongs to you there's value good for you but there's a value is a very broad spectrum well i'll ask you one question before we drag you back to circus school sure um Fucking hell, you <laughs> to. i absolutely i dragged myself back to circus school and, yeah. so um for you personally because you talked about 
it, you know, it's sort of in a broad sense, people think this. For you personally, was it more valuable to you when you created something rather than when you used something which was already in the idea sphere to, to get the effect? Yes, without doubt. Without doubt. But I don't think I created much for a long time. You know, really genuinely created much. There were when me and Noel did our did our first street show, which is post circus school, so we'll get to it. But we were a double act called the Unknown Stuntmen. And it was a sort of grab bag of the 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 shape of Penn and Teller. I spoke, he didn't. Um he's quite quiet, as you know, Noel. He's naturally he doesn't put himself forward, whereas I don't hold myself back. Um so we had the shape of that kind of dynamic. We had a slightly cartoonish thing. Vince Henderson gave us great um so like I was really pleased. Our, our kind of um, pedigree, if you like, was Vince and Herbie and Pepe. So they they saw something in us when we were like teenagers and kind of pushed us to discover things generally and challenged us and suggested things here and there. So it was sort of an amalgam of some ideas, but it was all pretty. It was generic ish shapes of a show. And it was only at the very end when there were like six little bits in a row where Noel would be about to do the leap of death and would burst into tears. And I would, it became quite dramatic and I would, I'd threaten him and I'd pretend to kill his little toy. And I sort of improvised her name once. I said, I will take a little cow toy. I said, I will, I will, whatever the line was, I will turn your darling Elizabeth. And they just got a huge laugh and I could see him laughing as well. I thought, okay, she's your darling Elizabeth forever. You know, those things were like the first real moments of like, oh, that was good. That's that bears repeating, and that's mine. That's ours, you know. Yeah. So, so I'm going to remember, darling Elizabeth. I'm going to use that as a point to touch back off in a moment. Okay. Circus school. What was your? So when you go to circus school, you're juggling five balls already. I could just about juggle five balls. I uh, know I could. I had a solid, a solid five ball cascade, and because of that, I thought like, not this is going to be a breeze, but I thought. I've got something to offer. And I got there and I was 18 years old and most people there were 23 plus, which is a bigger gap than it feels now. And there were, I don't know, 20 of us. And there was me and the other British people were five girls. And so there was no other, I didn't have a kind of buddy. Like everyone there was nice. I mean, I, I was in the same year as Captain Frodo. Uh, wow. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, who else? Who else came from there? I was the same year as Amy Saunders, but she was at Circus Base. Or maybe she was a year above me at Circus Base. We saw their end of year shows, the same year, I think. Um, but at, at Circa Media, there were Pedro. I was in the same year as Pedro. Oh, so, wow. Pedro Torchas, uh, for those yeah. who, who even at that time was the highest earning street performer I'd ever met and had a website before everyone else. Um, so he was doing like the three month course, and Frodo was as well. But I didn't have a buddy. I didn't have another British guy, ideally from the West Midlands, who was my age, who could hold my hand metaphorically and say, Jesus, this is terrifying. I had no idea it was going to be this frightening, this socially scary. I'm such a fish out of water. I'm so out of my depth physically. And I also didn't realise there were going to be this many press ups. I was an idiot. I was like, well, how do you think you're going to get good at stuff? Without, you know, we got there day one. They said it's an hour and a half conditioning every morning. And I just shattered, you know. So you think I, it's going to be smoking dope, smoking dope and juggling like a hippie juggling workshop? No, no, no dope. I just thought it was going to be learning like clowning and juggling. I could learn juggling. I was like, okay, people think I've been told for the last few years, wow, you're really good at juggling. I thought, well, I can do that. I was like, well, I don't have to do press. Why have I got to go for a run? What? You know, so. And, and then we would do the clowning stuff. And I was dreadful at it. I was like, I'm funny. I'm a funny guy. And uh, I wasn't. I don't know how much clown training you've done, but this was kind of Lecoq inspired. No one was sort of saying Goliath at the time, but it's all about being dreadful and learning to live with being dreadful. But no one says that. No one says this is about being dreadful and learning to live with it. They just, you do a thing, you fail, you feel like shit. And then you go home and cry into your pillow. And then you, you go out the next day, you go, this time I'm going to do it. And you feel like shit again. And... And so the things that I thought I was going to be good, I mean, day one of, of juggling training, I walked in, I was like, oh God, everyone can do five balls. Everyone, like every, these guys, Torsten and Philip, these, uh, I don't know what they went on to be called, but um, but they were a very pro double act who'd come there to sharpen their stuff up. And I was like, Ugh. so everyone was brilliant. Everyone was older. And I don't have a, I, I love people from Germany and Norway and Australia, but they just, I couldn't relate to them because I was like, I just need someone else here from Leamington to go, this is nuts, isn't it? Because everyone else just seemed to take to it really easily. And I was but there. That, 
but is that imposter syndrome? Do you well, think? I mean, maybe it would be. I'd be amazed if there was an area of my life where I didn't feel imposter syndrome. But I was certainly, I was young, and I was. Listen, I I got there because I failed to get into drama school. I failed to get into drama school, the one I wanted. Noel went to Manchester Met, and I had my heart set on Manchester Met, and I, I bailed the audition. And there were a couple of other places I got I didn't get into, or the one one I did get into, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to go. And I went, Do you know what? Sod this, I'm going to go to circus school because I started to, I suppose, in retrospect, what I did was looked at the kind of gamut of theatre schools and go, That's a bit proper, that's a bit normal, that's a bit like the real world. I want to do the opposite of that. I'll go to circus school, that'll be good to show off about. I mean, there was an awful lot of like, This will make me seem special, and that is a good thing. Whether I wanted to genuinely be in the circus, I don't know. I just sort of, I'd gone, oh, this is different and makes me feel good. So I knew in the first week, this isn't for me. And I stuck it out because um, I'm an idiot. And I, I was scared of disappointing who? Me? My, my parents wouldn't have cared. The school wouldn't have cared. But the fear of disappointing people is is writ large in, in my life. So I just kind of went, well, I'm doing it now. I'll do it. And um, there were fun moments here and there, but it was hard hard it was hard and it was the I, I often for years afterwards and probably still now would describe it as the hardest year of my life wow and did you get the feeling at any point in it that this is coming together that i'm starting to get it you know there was one session where we did almost the prototype of stand-up comedy and i used to think about that session a lot when i then started stand-up because there was we had to argue something ludicrous and then argue, also argue something sensible and then argue the opposite of it. And we went around in the circle and I smashed it. And I, I did something. I can even remember it was about um, it was about old people and we had to look after the elderly. And I argued that we had to look after the elderly. And then Bim, the director, said, OK, now argue the opposite. And I said, we have to kill the elderly. And everyone laughed. <laughs> And I said, we have to because they're using up all the food. In fact, we should eat the elderly. And, and it just, you know what I mean? And I just I was like, oh, this is my happy place. I can do this. I can't be butter melting in a pan. You know, I can't do all of this, all of this kind of clowny physical theatre stuff. Neutral mask. There was like first neutral mask. You put on this mask and they said, show us a neutral body. And I stood there like a sort of mad soldier trying to, desperately to be neutral. And everyone burst out laughing because it looked so the opposite. And I was like, well, why are they? I don't get it. But that bit, I went, I can do. I did that. I did that. And it felt honest and improvising and fun. And uh, so that is the that is the one moment in the nine months I was there that all the three how, whatever it is. How interesting! And were you doing street shows during this time? Did you do street shows before? Did the street shows come I, after? I did still? street shows before it. Yes, because me and Noel did street shows in Stratford on Avon when we were sixteen, seventeen, and we and did. Yeah. Why did you do street shows? Where did the idea of street shows come from to you? Well, we wanted to make money without getting jobs, and we wanted to make people laugh without having to get cast in anything. And we knew how to juggle fire and, and walk on broken glass. So we kind of went, we did a thing that was called Hot and Spiky Circus. And it was me and him. And we went and did a very prototypical uh, street show. But when we did a street show, we had never seen anyone do a street show. So well, this is for ourselves. This is what I'm interested in is like, where did the idea come from that you could do this? Because it's not necessarily something that's, yeah, that we, people are co cognizant of before they see it. No, I um, I don't know. We just, I just thought. Well, we were, we were, we were. We'd done theatre kid type stuff, and we knew about audiences. And I guess I knew that buskers were a thing that you see people with guitars and they play stuff, and then and you know people give them money. And I thought we could do a thing. We could do like ten minutes, and then we could say, "Now give us your money," and we did, and they did, and um, uh, we that was a big. I mean, you know, again, I, I actually talked about this in a in a stand up show about ten years ago. So it's hard to say without saying the the scripted bit. But I honestly remember us on the X sixteen bus on the way home from Stratford to Leamington, looking in a bowler hat, and we made thirty quid, and we looked at each other, and we just this we I, either we said or we just had a look. This changes everything because he hated school as well, and we went. This is our ticket into the into the world of otherness and madness it it felt like and again i've said this apologies but uh it felt like someone opened a little door in the universe and went lads this way and and it was like the way out and so that i suppose that informed the decision to go to circus school because that was like oh more of this but it just it wasn't more of that for me it was it was training and difficulty and i was oh god i was trying to get away from this i wanted i wanted sort of fun and warmth and wit and charisma and 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 joy um yeah 
it seems like you were naive to the labor that it takes to achieve uh, a product well no we did have a product i learned to juggle and i knew i could say funny things i don't know why i knew that but i we, we'd just gone out and done a show and i'd i just found that i wasn't scared of going excuse me mate can you stand there brilliant can you stand next to him that's a crowd and then they'd laugh and i'd go oh hello you know i just i could i could riff did you and have then, a structure so, sorry to sorry to um, interrupt um, yeah, back back in the old days not at that stage, you know, best best trick at the end. When we went up to Edinburgh, which our way into Edinburgh, we kind of infiltrated Edinburgh over three summers where we turned up and we did one week at the Mound and uh, with Sam and Andy, bless him, uh, uh, bless him, lovely Sam, but who passed away last year, um, or earlier this year, last year. And um, uh, we sort of, they, they kind of, I don't know, Sam was so important to me. Sam was Sam Skirlock from Sam and Andy, who the, the jugglers have worked at the Mound for years and years because they were the grand old men of the pitch. And if if Sam would even nod at me, I'd walk home feeling like, I'd be like, oh, Sam nodded at me. You know, there was a really, <laughs> it's really good. And he was hero a Hero worship. Guy. I don't know if you knew him. Um, but yeah, kind of hero worship because they were funny and they were solid and they were a double act that juggled and so were we. And we did, we turned up, but the first street performer we saw, not the first street performer we ever saw, but the first time we turned up, like we've got a big, heavy, cumbersome box of 20, tricks that we're going to do because we haven't thought this through at all we saw vince and we saw vince doing a street show and we remember we had a conversation like look at this guy he's only got three tricks you know and he had the perfect street show like the the perfect charisma vehicle it was he would do a whip where he'd want to whip off a he'd try and whip a cigarette out of a, a little toy bear's mouth but the head would come off and spill cotton wool everywhere oh so that's not a jp original I, I I would imagine they are of the same era. I'm certainly not going to look either of them in the eye and say you nicked that, but I mean, you know, I think JP's written more street stuff in his life. I think Vince would be the first to admit. Um, then he'd do eating the apple with two knives, and then he'd do um, two knives and a torch on a high unicycle. And we were like, look at this guy. He's only got three things. We're going to smash this. We've got loads. And then, of course, we couldn't fucking barely get a crowd. Um, but we... Uh, Again, I, I forget the question, but for some reason, Vince came to mind because that was the first. Oh, yeah, it was a structure. So our structure was dreadful. Our structure was, and we'd like, we, we'd rehearse. We'd rehearse for a week in Manchester Met. You know, we'd blag a room that Noel was in. I was living in Manchester at the time. And we'd come, we'd have a script. We would write down a script because that was, we were actors, we thought, you know. Um, and we did a show one year called, like the second year we went or the third year, it was called Not the Monkey Brothers. And the premise of it, which I stand by, was that we had bowler hats, brown suits, little brown tails, and little brown chin strap beards. And we came out and we would explain that some monkeys have recently escaped from a nearby circus, but don't worry, they're nowhere near here and we don't know anything about them. And then the, the, the idea was it was clear that we were the monkeys. And we did it once uh, and it had potential, but at that time I didn't know that it takes five years to build a decent street show. We did it once, it didn't really go very well, and then we were on the meadows and I was in tears and Noel was consoling me. and <laughs> He was fine with it. But I was just so highly strung and compulsive and desperate for it to work um, that it was sort of disastrous. And then we at the way we built the Unknown Stuntmen show was a process of overreaching and then not not succeeding to my standards and then pulling back to, oh, well, let's just do what we know. And then we'd overreach and then we'd pull that back and then we'd overreach and we'd pull that back. And it, actually, it turns out if you take all the tears out of it, that's quite a good way of working. So you don't think that being so critical was an obstacle to your creativity? Um, yeah, it probably was. I think if someone had said, no, definitely people said, don't worry, it takes a while. But I didn't hear it because in my head was like, this has to be perfect or I'm a failure. So the the what was the question is it critical to success these days do, do you think that um being so critical to yourself was a uh, negative towards creativity did it hinder your creativity yes, yes it really did that self criticism made me feel like an idiot and i don't think feeling like an idiot is is a platform for good work i think i really I was really hard on myself and consequently hard on noel fortunately he's a very robust personality so he just kind of bounced off him and didn't worry about it at all um but I, I would have made better work if I was happier and more relaxed. And but I always felt like if I stay, if I 
if I get happy and start being relaxed, I won't do anything. I'll just lie on the floor like a jellyfish. I won't achieve, you know, so I've got to beat myself. I've got to kind of hit myself very hard. And, and you know, there's there's momentum and there's there's resilience and there's drive. But all of those things were kind of corrupted with me. They were like, if you don't do this, then you're a piece of shit. So it, it could have, you know, we did become successful. That, that double act, we then went to Australia, which was very hard. Um, as you'll know, if you've worked it, we were on Circular Quay, uh, like under the bridge in Sydney. And then we, we briefly dared to go to Darling Harbour for a bit. And, uh, and it was hard and they wouldn't stop and they wouldn't stay. And everything we were doing was too subtle and too silly and too English for their, you know, Australians, it's hot. So get cut to the chase. <laughs> you know, that, that's a good way to put it. Dress up, say, there's, here's my chainsaw. There's my bike. I'm going to get on that and juggle this. Now, I don't want to paint all Australian streets like that at all. But there is a, I mean, God knows how Living Space attained the brilliance that he has in Australia because it's just hard. So it was hard, but we got good. And then we came back and we did a, a competition for the Scottish National Busking Championships. And um, uh, Guy, the amazing guy, uh, was doing it, and so was Silver, and so were the Crazy Tramps, and that's all the people. Who, who are the Who are the Crazy Tramps? I don't know. We only met them on that on that one gig, really. They were trampolinists, and they, okay. I think, they inherited the act from either one of their dads or something. It was like a big, you know, not really street show, festival show, a big trampoline. And I remember we were quite good then, and I said, "What's a, what year is this?" Just to place it in the chronology. Two thousand one. Two thousand one. Okay. We all got together in the pub. It was one of those competitions which feels a bit rigged, which is like no one gets paid. You can come and work for your hats. And the winner, there's a competition, the winner will get two grand. And uh, I said the night before, I said, we're all mates, you know, to a greater or less extent. Why don't we just make a gentle person's agreement now that whoever wins, this, I sort of feel a bit ripped off that there has to be a winner. That doesn't feel in the spirit of it. Why don't we make an agreement now that whoever wins will split the money? And everyone went... I could do with two grand. So they didn't. And then the next day, we had no expectations. We won. And we were like, they gave us the check. And we we're like, sweet, our train's about to leave. Taxi, bye guys. <laughs> Ran off with money, you know. So that was very satisfying because the show did become very robust. And then after that, we had probably three brilliant Edinburgh's where we got better and better and better until once or twice we had those kind of roadblock Pete Dobbing shows on the on the Royal Mile just outside the fringe office. There was one moment I looked at Noel and the the noise of the applause bouncing back and forth in between those high buildings was deafening. They loved us. And and when we were good, when it worked, what they loved was I can't like almost the feeling was you guys can't believe that we're making you love this old shit, right? Do you know what I mean? There was like a really, but in a really healthy way, like a real kind of like, we've got nothing and it's brilliant. And that was what I loved about it. That was what I, I was much more interested in. We have a relationship, me and Noel. I'm going to, I'm threatening your little toy cow. You love us. You, I, I, I'm the overblown kind of Capitan figure and he always wins by doing something simple. And it's, it's like nothing. It's just air and it's making you all go nuts. We're just get that. That to me was the challenge. Kind of uh, draw a show out of nothing by using willpower and charisma. And that was the challenge. And that was a difficult, that was a rocky path because sometimes it wouldn't work and you'd just be there going, it, that's nothing. <laughs> you know, there's an old Simon Munnery joke. I have nothing to declare about apart from my genius. I'll just put that down as nothing, shall I? You know, if, if it doesn't work, if you're trying to spin up nothing into a house of cards and it doesn't work, you've just got nothing. And for someone with more. <laughs> mental health issues that was, was just painful well they've got to buy into you haven't they for this to work if they don't buy into what you're yeah. selling you can't just go well it's really hard you know you can't say that oh, sure but the, the, the things yeah. the good bits about us weren't even they weren't even the tricks they were the reactions they were the they were the you know it was the i think it was like the the, the good bits were the 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 funniest thing i ever said in a street show that I, in those days was I just at one point I was trying to do a really difficult trick. There was lots of jeopardy and I'd messed it up and I dropped one of my clubs and a kid laughed and I just barked at him. I just went, shut up. And it was, it was like a, like a black adder kind of shut up. And it was really like everyone just died laughing. And the way I said it then seemed a bit mean. I didn't like, I wasn't mean to a kid, but I was like, shut up. And it was clearly it was shut up, but I lose. And it was like a really true natural clowny thing came out of me, which is I think when I was trying to learn clowny stuff at circus school, I was all about like, oh, I'm I'm cute and I'm a nice, optimistic guy, you know. And the reality leapt out of me it was like, no, I'm a horrible little shit, and and I'm proud and I'm vain, and I know those things now, 
but like how can you access them when you're a kid you know so so it just blurted out of me and they went we like this because he looks and sounds nice and he turns out to be a prick and that's funny and it's you're losing as well. They like someone to be indignant of their own loss, to have a tantrum yes. that's con that's a controlled tantrum. They know that it's tongue in cheek. It's farcical. Sure, I, think, right. I mean, Ed, I heard Eddie Izzard say years ago, which I misinterpreted for a long time. He said the job of a comic is basically to get out there and tell them what a terrible person you are. And it took me a it took me a career to work out what that means. And I think it's this sort of thing that we're talking about. What they yeah. it's like no one ever says to you. I can't imagine how different my life would have been if when I was 10, someone had whispered in my ear, um, if you want people to like you, tell a story where you lose. Do you know what I mean? Like not, not to, not in a kind of arch way, make manipulate yeah. people, but that's the basis of comedy. I've, I've, the other day I went out and I fell down a hole and everyone's like, you fucking idiot. You go, I know, but I was so kind of battered by school and the fear of people genuinely laughing at me and the fear of genuinely people looking down on me and me feeling like an outsider that I couldn't own failure. And if you can't own failure, you can't be a clown. So you say that your show worked, that you made the show work, you and Noel. How did you get to that point then from the show sort of not working and taking these tentative steps forward, then having to pull back? Or Pat, I'm going to ask you a different question first and then we'll go on to that one. Okay. First question. When you do something in a show and the show fails or it doesn't hit, can you describe the feeling that you have? Because it seems like you're someone maybe like myself where if things are going badly, you get a, a, a physical feeling, a physical sensation yeah, when you're on stage. 100%. Yeah. The, the, for me, that's all in my chest. Like I, I, I have like a sort of a, a sort of residual kind of trauma clench in my chest and I go, oh God. And obviously there's the physiological stuff. There's, you know, your mouth dries and you're pupils probably dilate or something, you know, but um, all of that stuff happens. And internally, the for me, the domino effect of I'm shit, I shouldn't be here, I'm an imposter, it's all been luck till now, this is a disaster, what am I going to do, this is terrible, is kind of, kind of blaring, you know, all of that's coming out over a klaxon. And physically, I'm kind of, um, kind of, kind of crumpling and panicking. And I you've got to pretend nothing's happening. You yeah, got to pretend that you're fine. I know that now, and I have strategies to deal with it. But at the time, I couldn't even, I couldn't even kind of register that was happening because I was too busy thinking I'm shit. It's like the way depression works; it hides itself from you, and it makes you think that the world is actually awful, rather than I have a problem with my perception and I have a, a, a resolvable challenge that I'm undergoing right now. Instead, it's like I always say this: it's like the episode of Red Dwarf, like season three, an episode called Better Than Life, where they all play a virtual game and the game hides itself, so you think it's actual life. That's what depression's like. And that's what it's like when you're bombing on stage. You, It's so hard to get, I find it so hard to gear change out of it and go, this is a thing that I'm in control of. You know, this is like, I'm, I'm nose diving the plane, but I, it's not gonna crash right now. I can stop, I can take a deep breath and I can calmly grab the, the joystick rudder. I don't know what it's called. Um, <laughs> the, the stick, stick. The stick, grab the stick yeah. and, and just gently take action gently take action and there's a million ways to recover when something's going horribly wrong but locking up and doubling down and going or telling them this is shit isn't it i'm sorry you know <laughs> whatever it is those probably aren't going to work well i've always been tempted by the idea that you could go deep into that so you you start having that by accident but then you just go all hell for leather into that and you fall apart in cataclysmic some fireworks really well some people do that really mm -hmm. well and um, there's a, an american comic called zach zucker who does a character called jack tucker who is a failing stand-up comedian and he's really good at leaning into how terribly badly it's all going you know or neil hamburger this is a character a comic called greg turkington who's like a sort of awful horrendous kind of grotesque version of a stand-up who walks, shuffles on stage with his hair slicked over in a suit and three drinks spilling everywhere, you know. Like, they're, they're really good at playing with the idea of, is this gone wrong? Is, is this wrong now? Is this going wrong? Is it Can I make it worse? Yes. Or even someone like Phil Kay, who um, I, I remember Phil Kay said to me on, on my podcast years ago, when because he can drop, oh my God, Phil Kay can tank a gig. He is so completely... Um, dedicated to the discovery and the adventure of the show that sometimes it will go horribly wrong and he will keep going to, to save it, not to ruin everyone's night, but he'll know that if he pulls back, he's got nothing. So he'll keep going. 
or not he's got nothing but if he pulls back that's not the point is what i mean so he'll keep going and he said to me years ago he said you know these or he said the list of awful failure gigs is so long he said but i think if it's bad how bad is that you know, I just think that question, like, was it bad? Is it digging holes? Is it getting trapped in a mine shaft? Is it, is it, you know, it's not, it's not bad. It just feels horrible. So I think the way, the, from what I loosely understand from people who are very good at clowning, they call it the shit in kind of Dolier clowning and learning to live in the shit. Like this is failing and I'm fine with that. That's, you know, that's one of the big secrets of all comedy, I guess. And so how did you write and take the show then? This is the first question, which I deferred from. Mm -hmm. How did you take the show from being not working and, you know, the mound and not getting big crowds like Vince did when you saw him there to being a show which is on the high street, rocking, you're getting that feeling that you looked for when you were young? Practice and hunger and getting up early and doing three, three. I mean, you used to be able to do three shows a day in Edinburgh. Imagine. Um, and the money was an incentive because we were kids and we needed money. And we, you know, when, you know, the first time you make a hundred quid off a street show and you go, oh, oh, oh my God, you know. So, but just practice and intention, being intentional and going, we want to get better. We are learning. This is a process. This is school for us. So this is training. And every time we do it, we're going to learn. And every time we do it, we're going to keep our eyes open. And what happened last time? What can we do differently this time? So really kind of just throwing ourselves into it. That's the positive side of my work ethic, I think, you know, like just yeah. working really hard rather than thinking, oh, let's not bother going in today. We'd always go in, you know, you'd always show up. And so you can't help but, you know, this, that's the, the better. perspiration. You can't help but get better, yeah. Yeah, I talked to John Park and he said that his partner used to sit and write and take notes from every single show. And say this worked, this didn't work, you know, and, and analyze every piece of work they did together. Did you guys do that? No, no, we didn't. What we did, what I did was I would sit and try and write jokes and I'd try and write routines and they were dreadful without fail. They were awful. But I did try and I kept trying and I recognized that as being part of my job. Certainly when I then had a solo street show, I would sit in the what was it called? Fire and Water, the other balcony. As you look at the Punch and Judy, the balcony on the left, which I assume is now an apple shop or whatever. It's you know? Laundry. It's now yeah. a French restaurant that serves little biscuits. Yeah, sure, sure. But there was some I had very happy times sitting up there having a drink at Fire and Water in the summer. But before, when I was building that solo show, I was trying to write jokes and trying to write things. I did a thing where the gag was, I had a, it was all based around lunch. I had a lunchbox. And the whole show was I had to fit in a lunchbox. So I thought that'll be good, a limitation that'll make me creative. So the finale was eating a packet of crisps on the rope. It was like a rope in a lunchbox. The rope didn't have to fit in the lunchbox. Only certain, only so many things you can limit. Um, but I had a bunch of grapes and I would get, I'd hand them out to the audience. I'd get the audience to throw them at me. I'd catch them in my mouth and then I'd do, and now juggling the contents of my stomach and I'd do a little sort of wiggly, dumpy, jumpy dance. It was dreadful. It never worked. It never worked. I kept hammering at it. I kept coming up with endless grape puns, jokes about grapes. It was all rubbish. It was all absolute shit. But it kind of, at least I wasn't not trying. You know, the simple fact of trying and going, I'm going to try and write jokes today. I'm going to write five jokes today. None of them work. This is dreadful. But at least I did my five jokes. Was it like you were panning for material? Well, yeah, I don't know what it was like. I, I sort of, again, it wasn't a happy time, really, because I didn't have a sense that there is a system. In comedy now, there are so many comedians and there are books written about how to do comedy. And there are so many people you can ask. And there is now, for me, the knowledge that you can ask people. I never really asked another street performer, how did you come up with that joke? How do you write? What does it look like when you sit down and, and write your act? That just wasn't done. I don't know. I never had the idea. So um, I didn't. There was no system and it never occurred to me really. Well, it, I suppose I, I created my own system, which was try and be bad and just keep trying. And then eventually what I realized is that if I'm happy, and there are people watching me if I'm on stage and I'm in a good mood, I can probably think of something. And that would have been a great lesson to have learned 10 years earlier. But if I put myself in a funny situation, if I ask someone in the crowd something provocative, not like super challenging, but just something that isn't a yes, no answer, you know, what do you dream about? Then then like suddenly we've got a problem, haven't we? Because they're going to say something and I've got to say something because I'm, I've asked the question. And that, that being in the abyss, jumping out, being in free fall, 
tends to come it tends to work for me nowadays and it did occasionally there in flashes so i realized that actually my best self is making stuff up on the fly and the structure of the show just became a thing i could fall back on if a thing didn't work so at the beginning of my show which was always low stakes low height low danger again I tell myself now it was that was on purpose so that I'd get good. And I think that's honest. I really did. You know, I could have done a giraffe uni and torches, but it was a bit common. You know, it was a bit popular. And and I thought it'd be nice to invent a thing. And it'd be nice if the thing I invented was I, I wanted to make things hard for myself. <laughs> I just always have. I wanted to make things hard for myself because I thought then I'll learn to be really funny. And um, and so I what's I gonna say? Um so you're having low stakes, a low finale. You're keeping on the ground to make yourself better. It's the beginning of the show, got a case, bang the case down on the cobbles. And I was in my street clothes and I've got a costume. I'd pull my costume out and I'd stand on the thing and I'd strip to my pants and I'd explain that any minute now I'm going to get in a costume, right? If you've got no height or danger, you might as well stand in your case and take your clothes off. So I'm there in my pants. By the end of my career as a street performer, that section occupied 30 minutes of the show. And then I'd quickly do three tricks and get on the rope. <laughs> you know what I mean? Maybe 30 is exaggerated, but maybe certainly I certainly stand out there for 20 minutes doing effectively walk by improvised comedy, not bits, just walk by making stuff up as I went along, talking playing. to people, riffing, that kind of stuff, just playing. Yeah, just playing. Yeah. And, and that, and again, for a, I mean, in those days, not many people had mics. And I didn't have a mic really ever. I used to lose my voice quite easily. So it was hard to be in a kind of playful space. But really, probably the happiest street shows I remember, some of the happiest ones were like at Glastonbury, where you're on a tiny stage and you've got a tiny little mic and the audience is there. You know, the street, the pavement riser at the Glastonbury Festival. It's not a street show because you go uh, uh, um, and 30 people turn around and then two minutes later, you've got a huge edge. But I felt so happy improvising and being silly. And I had a really healthy, not like a disrespect exactly, but I could look them in the eye and go, this is a load of old rubbish and you're going to love it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and that was quite beguiling. And I felt that was good, you know. So, so a certain amount of earned self-deprecation about what I was doing. And I, I, when I would eat, we'd all eat at Master's Diner in Covent Garden. I don't know if that predated you. You know Master's on Henry's. I know I saw Master's before I went. Mate, I had some very happy breakfast in there with Matt Ricardo eating eight hash browns with a can of Coke. Um, so that was him, not me. <laughs> we all know our perfect breakfast orders. But I remember being the young kid who'd just come to London and uh, and asking the grown-up street performers, so what's your show? And, of course, they were like, come off it, mate. It's just have your breakfast, you know, um, and then, or I'd say, what's you, what, so what do you do in your show? And they'd say, same old shit. And I'd be like, oh, wow. That, you know what I mean? I couldn't quite get the thing. And then years later, it was such a badge of honor. The first time I was one of the older ones and a new, it's in Edinburgh sometime, a new bright Canadian comic who already had a, a Canadian street performer who already had a website, but no act and was super into it and was going, you know, bless, bless him. That energy's lovely. You know, <laughs> like, so, so what do you do? And I got to say, same old shit, you know, and, and it doesn't mean I'm not saying what I do is shit. What I'm saying is I no longer need to constantly talk about it and big it up because I know I'm good. You know, I know yeah. I do. So if you want to see it, you know, come and look at it. But I just do a bit, you know, this chat. Basically. I'm, I'm comfortable enough that I don't need to validate myself by engaging with your enthusiasm. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I know, you know, I, I hope I said it in an avuncular friendly way rather than, or at least a fraternal friendly way, you know, rather than, you know, I never, there's, there's so many opportunities in street performing is so hard and there are so many opportunities to cut people down. There are so many opportunities to bully people off the pitch to even Pepe, bless him, Pepe looking out at a show that he desperately wants to do, but it's your show and going, I wouldn't do it. You know what I mean? To try and knock you off course. There was a bit of that here and there. And there was so many, we're all on edge. We've all, we're all knowing, we've all got adrenaline. We all need to pay the rent. And it's easy to be mean. It's easy to be selfish. It's easy to be kind of just negative about the whole thing. It's hard. And we might have had a bad gig or come from a bad gig. There's no oversight. There's no governing body. No one's in charge of it. And it's a bunch of self-interested individuals. But the moments I loved were when there were moments of proper community, when, when Great Dave 
would be at the draw and someone would be saying, you know, we should we should say so-and-so can't work here because they keep bringing their show. They're wasting 40 minutes on the pitch. They're not good enough for this pitch yet. And Dave would go, nope, this isn't the Olympics. This is here for everyone. And I'd go, God damn it, I wish I'd said that. You know, because... Like that's that's the thing, and then with Edinburgh now, that every year as as the numbers go up, I say every year. I've not been properly present at the draw for God knows how long, but as it gets harder and harder to work, there are always conversations about should we limit this? Should we just say it's us? Should we basically turn it into a protection racket? And I love that's one mentality. This is the Olympics, and you bring your A game. And it's just for the best people. But I've always been on the side of no, this is for everybody. It's the park. And we all walk around and do our thing. And if you don't get to make 500 quid because someone's tanking, tough luck, you knew the risks. If you don't like it, get a proper job. But so it also, I, is there a thing that it's an art form? Because it's not just it's not just a sport. It's not just a high jump. It's not just who jumps highest. Of course, of course. Who's to say what's good or bad? You know, and my least favourite show might be someone else's favourite show, you know, or the, like, if I think of the most outrageous moments, Pepe's gag with the, the making the balloon animal and the kid comes up to it and he stamps on it and gives the kid the finger. I've never managed to explain to someone who hasn't seen it how funny and pure and magical that moment is. Because it sounds like, you know, it sounds awful. Um, but those moments of sort of wonder and joy and, you know, Herbie Treehead doing the last show in the sunset at 5 p.m. or Living Space in the Tron or Jesus, however many, you know, Hangerman and Cabo and all these guys, these, these again in Hangerman and Cabo were like these three Japanese performers that all came one year. And me and Noel used to say they were like secret gods. They were like Japanese gods because one was fire and one was air and one was metal. And, um, and it was like they'd been cursed to walk the earth as street performers. And, you know, all of this kind of, all of the glory, you know, all of that stuff is, um, it, it, it's art. It is art. And I'm occasionally, I get in trouble. Asaf, you'll know Asaf. He gets, um, he, he had a go at me, particularly we're good friends. But he sort of said, you've got to stop talking down street performing when you mention it on, on your podcast. I do a show called The Comedian's Comedian. And I it, it occasionally comes up that I used to do street shows. And um, he said, you've got to stop talking down street performing. And I think he'd misinterpreted that idea of the same old shit, you know, as if I was looking down on it and I'm not looking down on it. Whether you're, whether what you do, if your street show is 30 tricks with a football and that's it, you're still, you're still taking a risk by being there. So maybe that is not as artistic to me as um, Jeff Actim when he used to go or, um, or uh, Gilly going out and doing a proper, I've planned none of this and I'm just going to play and see what happens and I won't make any money and I don't care. It's still, you're still doing the thing. You're still risking something. You're still sort of physically, it is art. It's just not necessarily always very good art, but it is art. And it's certainly, it's got a mythic thing. You touched upon the idea of the, the Japanese gods. Hmm. I find this thing that street performers have this mythology that it's, it's not touched on in a lot of the, um, entertainment is absolutely true and the the mythic quality of it was enormously romantic and compelling and attractive to me all of those things whereby because come on we walk between the raindrops we you now i don't do it anymore i always wanted to be i i, I once saw maybe andre vince was it andre vincent or, or someone who had moved on and wandered through Covent Garden and was like, all right, lads, and kind of looked out happily and then left. And I was like, I want to be that guy. And now I am, you know? And it's so much easier now to look back on it now that I never have to do it again because it's hard and it's scary. And it's lovely to go, oh, I did this and I did that. And of course, I don't need to commit myself anymore and, and feel the actual fear of just before you walk out. But, is um, that why you stopped? Is it because you is it because you didn't oh, want to have to do that forever? Um, the, the two things I think are that I realized some of my friends were getting older. And I thought, oh, I don't want to be 50 and have to do street shows. I'd love to be able to do a street show when I'm 50, but I don't want to have to. I don't want to have to grind a show to get the rent when I'm old. So there was that always in the back of my mind. And I was bored isn't the right word, but I felt like I had had a glorious period of learning. And that period was sort of over. I thought I've probably learned as much as I can from this. And you can't. Like I just did, I just, I just always knew that I wanted to try stand up. And in 2004, I did one stand up gig and street performing lost me forever. I did it in the blue post in Kingly street in Soho and I wasn't very good. And I came off stage and I went, I know what I am now, you know? And, and then as I got into stand up, it doesn't have the community 
It doesn't have the same community that street performing had. And in many ways, as I became a stand-up, I missed out on a lot of the community that stand-up does have because I, when we were at the Edinburgh Festival, which is like, you know, college for stand-ups, I would want to hang out with my old, you know, <laughs> old, they're not all old. Street, but, you know, yeah, I want to go and sit with Pete Dobbing and Asaf and Vince and Herbie and put the world to rights, you know? Um, and uh, And so I missed out on a certain amount of, you know, I would often live with street performers rather than living with comics. So I've, I've kind of bemoaned the fact that comedy doesn't have the same community. Maybe I just didn't do it right because I already had a community or a, or a group. But um, but is there not this thing, right? And I've often thought this. With street performance, there's no gatekeepers. There's no one when you go to the pitch is going to say, you're not good enough, go, generally speaking, most of the time. Some festivals are exceptions. Yeah. But in stand-up, you're relying, I assume, on people booking you. So you are competing with the guy next to you. Whereas when I go to a pitch, I'm not competing with the people next to me. I'm just queuing with them and waiting my turn. That is true. Yes. Yes. I don't think, I mean, I've been in dressing rooms in LA, clang, where um, where all the actors backstage on the phone to their agent and just kind of grunt at each other. I mean, maybe maybe they were all chatting till I walked in. I don't know. But, but you know, the, the, in the UK, it's not really like that. It is warm. There is community. And the 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 instances where there is something genuinely on the line, where there's a producer in and you're all doing fives and only was only one slot available and someone's going to get picked, even then you might be internally thinking, God, I hope they don't do as well as I did. You know, you wouldn't, you don't normally say that. It is warm, and I've got loads of great, great friendships through through comedy. But you don't all sit together in the same place day after day, chewing the fat, looking out the window, wondering. You know, having you don't have a load of free time together with the same people on the same pitch all the time. What happens in comedy a lot of the time is you'll do some gig somewhere, you'll really get on with one of the other acts, but not really well enough to swap numbers because you've only met once on a long car journey, and then you might not gig with them for two years. And so it's sort of littered with opportunities for like missed opportunities for friendships. Oh, I loved that. Oh, 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 and they're, oh, you know, much harder to find. Even if you get on with someone, when do we, when do the gigs match up? When do we, you know, it's, it ruins all your social time. And I was never really a hangout after the gig, drink in the bar, get pissed with the comics person because I'm just not, I don't, you know, I don't tend to do that. Sometimes I do. And those, those are lovely times. But yeah, the community is definitely very, very different. But coming back to the idea of the archetypal, I think that was one of the most attractive things to me about street performing because it, it has that kind of incorrigible or in, encourageable rogue. It has that mythic vagabond. People were doing this 5,000 years ago. You know, when you invent your juggling and you invent columns for yourself and you're like, bloody hell, I've made up a trick. And then you see it on some hieroglyphs. You know, those guys were sitting watching each other doing shows and going, would you nick that? Yeah, I'd nick that. Well, it's generic then, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? They were, they were doing that. So the fact that it's been going forever and that it's is so honest, it doesn't rely on anyone else. Conrad, I don't know if you've spoken to uh, Conrad. Uh, Conrad Brucey, yeah. I haven't spoken to him yet, but he's definitely on the list. He said to me years and years ago, what I love about street performing is, and it, not just the fact that I know Conrad, you know, all these people from all over the world who just hang out and go for breakfast and do shows and love each other's acts and, and chat and stuff. He said, the ultimate logical extension of street performing is that I walk into a shop, do a handstand and get given a tin of beans. And I'm like, yeah, that's great, isn't it? Isn't that like I'm not damaging the topsoil? I'm not murdering the environment. I'm not being awful to anyone. I'm not grinding anyone's fat. I'm not, you know, obviously there is a privilege to it in that you need to be in a society. Do you even need a privilege? I mean, I certainly approached it from a position of privilege. I could, I could kind of <coughs> take a risk on it. You know, um, I was never in a situation where if I didn't get the show off today, I'm going to get thrown out of my accommodation. That never but, happened. But look at Herbie. I mean, Herbie, I don't think he'd mind me saying this. When he first started street performing, he had nowhere to live. Yeah, and he, yeah, yeah. he came from that. So you can have a privileged beginning. But it also, oh, yeah. at, at least for now, in April, it might change. You can have an opportunity to, to go from nothing to something. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And that does that can happen in comedy. Elements of comedy are meritocratic. You know, there really is like you, you, you can't. I don't think you can honestly say comedy is a meritocracy, but you you can't do it. You can't get successful without the ability to do the thing. <laughs> you mean, you can't you can luck into breaks, but you've got to be funny. You've got to deliver the goods. Um, and I think with street performing. Yeah, I just think the I think the archetypal quality of like you can be you can it felt like 
everyone was a superhero. A lot of people had fake names. I mean, I, I still don't know what Shep's real name is, but I'll never forget the twinkle in his eye when I was having this chat with him years and years ago. I said, it's great, isn't it? It's like doing a heist for the rest of your life. You know, you you kind of, you just, you, like you enter countries illegally sometimes or you, or what have you, you know, you do this, how are they going to, you can't get sacked. You're just a wandering kind of guy. You wander wherever you want. And we talked about some element of it. And I, I made some point like that. And Shep looked at me and was like, and Shep Huntley's not even my real name. And I was like, I love it, I love it. You know, <laughs> and I'm pleased to not know what your real name is. So, um, you know, you get to invent yourself, don't you? You get to create a character for yourself. And depending on how dorky you are, you get to walk around in that costume every day for the rest of your life. Yeah, I suppose the thing you touch on as well that I think is interesting, because that's maybe what you went through when you stopped, is that you create this character, and a lot of people create these characters when they're young people. And the character almost can't survive their their journey out of adolescence and through middle age and to to the you know the later half of being middle aged. Yeah, well, Sharon Mahoney, fabulous Sharon Mahoney. Now, tour, I don't know if she's touring, but she you know great success at the Edinburgh Festival and stuff. I've known Sharon forever since pre. You know, she was Sharon from Canada and then Tallulah, the juggling whore, I think, for a while. And now she's doing this incredible show, the name of which I won't mention. Um, yes, uh, we, I don't think you can mention, but it's a very good show. I went to see it. it was yeah, yeah. Joy. Excellent show. Yes. And yeah. Sharon told me years ago, um, and I'm aware, actually, before I say this, I'm aware a lot of the people I've named are men and they're white men. And that's just kind of that's just where we were at that time. You know, I've also been very inspired by FEMA, by like Amy Saunders, who, you know, was like, I don't think she was ever satisfied with her output on the street, but just exploded into this incredible kind of cabaret uh, performer and cabaret host and what have you. Um, and just, you know, there are so many, there's brilliant females as well. It's just that females, there's brilliant female performers as well. It's just that Vince Herbie and, you know, and and Tony and Pepe were, were our pedigree at the time. But Sharon was telling me about there's a sort of streety story about Bike Boy, um, who uh, and I've got to, I've got a nod to but I can never remember if I ever told him this. But when I was 17 doing A levels at Stratford College, on one rainy day they played a video of our chaos. They played um, like a documentary about our chaos, and uh, no one was interested. And I was completely captivated and watched the whole thing. And there was this. A uh, little Bristolian lad that did a little interview with it. I just, I just drove down into the thing. I just rode my bike down into the ring. After the show and I just started doing tricks on my bike, and and it was a, you know, we had a big uh, Mohican. And I remember the time thinking, God, the world's even more full of possibility than I'd realised. And then, twenty years later, having been friends with Bike Boy for ten years, I suddenly he mentioned being in our chaos, and I was like, Oh God, I think you've changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> But um, Sharon was saying that we were talking about, you know, it, it evolving and whether you can keep the same character, you know. And it, you know, it's, it's, I think Bike Boy, like he's famous in Australia because of Hey Hey It's Saturday, this kids show, or he was at the time. And he kind of he went to do a high dive. I'm telling this story secondhand, but he went to do some sort of high dive at something. He got to the top and decided he didn't want to do it. And uh, and a kid went, Hey, I know you. You're Bike Boy. You wouldn't jump off. You're not bike boy. You're bike girl. And he was like, "Fuck you, kid," and then jumped off. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it, it's hard. It's hard to to you design a thing when you're a kid, but I think it is. People probably think that it is a failing to be flexible because you're giving up on the dream. But the way I always think, like I'd never have a tattoo because I remember having a pencil case when I was a kid and scribbling all over my pencil case. And I'm really glad I haven't got to wear it for the rest of my life. You're allowed to change. You're allowed to grow and you're allowed to like different things. So, you know, I think it's when people, their sense of self is so deeply coupled to their, um, to their persona. Like they need to be this persona in order to feel like themselves. And I think that's a shame. And if anyone is listening to this thinking, maybe I'm one of those, then I think that you could just probably trust yourself to slacken off the rules you made for yourself because actually what's good about you isn't your persona and your haircut and your jacket what's good about you is your connection to an audience and that can wear any clothes there you go what a great thing to say and i know that um we're sort of pushed on time a little bit so i'm just going to ask you a couple of last questions if that's okay yep, yep, yep. so last one or the last few ones someone's going to start busking you get loads of advice this entire interview is packed with really inspirational and insightful 
uh, quotes and uh, verses about what it is to be a street performer. But if you had to condense something to tell a young person when they're beginning street performance, what would you say to them? God, I've never been asked that. Um, that sounded sarcastic. I'm not being sarcastic. I've never been asked <laughs> be a street performer. Jesus, get in quick before they take away all the public space. Um, and also uh, ask for help. Ask for help. Like you, I, I always, I grew up feeling conditioned to solve every problem myself. And if I couldn't do it, then I was a piece of shit. And I, I just had to try harder and all the rest of it. Just ask for help. Ask for the right help. And don't try and do your career by committee. Don't ask everybody, you know, but just the, the advice is always get out there and do it. Just get out there and do it. Pete W, I don't know if you had Pete on the show. Not yet. Almost everything clever, I think, is something I've nicked from Pete Dobby. Um, he, uh, he's got such a mind for stuff like this. But when he was coaching Hazel to become his, his wife, uh, who is now one of the best female street performers in the world. I think she's just a phenomenon. He was coaching her to become a, a, a street performer. She was an actor at the time. And uh, he was like, he was coaching her. It was perfect. He wasn't teaching her, he was coaching her. And I was just privy to a lot of it. We were living together in Edinburgh one year when, when that was going what's, on. What's the difference between teaching and coaching? Then? Well, this is, I'm about to explain, Matthew, um, yeah. which is that she would say, I came off and I, I just couldn't get this thing right. What can I do? What should I do about it? And he would go, I'm not going to listen to any questions until you've done another 20 shows. So that, do you know what I mean? Like, just get out there and do, just do and do and do, and you will learn. And there's, you will learn so much more from doing than you will from listening to podcasts, pontificating or anything else. So go and like, come back and reflect on it, but just do it in the first place and do it in as many weird and unusual different places and do it in as many different ways as you possibly can think of different ways. You know, if you've got a costume, try wearing the opposite of that costume and see how it makes you feel, you know, try, try walking on, try walking on your show as if you're, uh, as if you're on trial and they're the jury, try walking on as if you're the king and they're your subjects, just try everything and discover who you are. Great advice. And is there anything last thing you want to say to all the friends that might be watching? And I know there's in the comments, you have people like Haggis and Dynamite, oh, Joel, Scott saying hello. So is there anything you want to say to all the people that might have watched? Um, hello. I didn't know you were there because my screen is reversed because I've built an auto queue. You'll have noticed I've been talking to you, looking down the barrel of the camera whilst looking at Matt's face because this morning I built my own auto queue. So I'm sorry if I'd known you were there, I would have thought of something more cogent, but your names are all backwards. Cool. Well, there you go, everyone. <laughs> thank you for watching. Stu, thank you, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure talking thank to you. you. You have a good day, pal. Everybody, thank you. If you've, uh, if you've been watching through to here and you're not yet, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, follow us on Facebook. For now, everyone, goodbye.